the real challenge opportunity of our company is that um, you know we're not an RV, but when I've had no money, we had to marry the RV distribution network, you know, and RV dealerships, because when you have a big product, you have to solve the sales and the distribution and the warranty service aspects of the process. We've always wanted to be smarter than the RV industry. And so we always knew that we had to go to meet our customer where they were in every way, you know, in information way through social media and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, on the phone at mountain bike rallies or surfing contests or uh, overlanding rallies. How do we get out there? Because that's, it's so obviously the future. Hello and welcome to D2C Podcast. I'm Eric Dick. Today, we're overlanding with camper trailer brand Taxa Outdoors, whose founder and CEO, Garrett Finney, went from building habitats for NASA to designing Taxa to be rugged and utilitarian like the vast landscapes his habitat on wheels are built to transverse. This talk goes into interesting areas we don't often reach, including the restrictions of the dealership model and how digital alleviates them, as well as really interesting cross-product collaborations, festival marketing, and cross-country rallies with 30 cricket taxa trailers in tow. Sign me up. Let's get out of home for real and on with the show. I just got back from D2C Newsletter's C-Suite Mastermind in Las Vegas, and I got to tell you that this room of 100 D2C and retail operators were just buzzing about Tapcart mobile shopping apps. A lot of the brands in the room are already using Tapcart, and the ones who weren't are thinking about it because a mobile app is going to improve your retention. It's also going to allow you to diversify your distribution strategies, which has never been more important. And more than that, your customers are just going to love it. Mobile app users have proven to be bigger, diehard fans of your brand. They've got higher conversion rates, revenue per session, and LTV compared to users that come to your web-based store. Just like fashion brand Princess Polly, who launched their app in 2019 using Tapcart and now consistently see 20 to 25% of their revenue coming from this channel, it's their second highest revenue channel after their online store. With Tapcart, it's incredibly easy to build, launch, and maintain your mobile apps. So to learn more, go right now to tapcart.com slash DTC. That's tapcart.com slash DTC. Tell them Eric sent you. Garrett, welcome to the D2C podcast. I'm super happy to have you here. Big fan of your brand. Can you tell me the hero's journey of Taxa Outdoors? The hero's journey? Um, yes, I think of that. It's kind of my, my own story. So uh, I grew up being an outdoorsy person in New England, but then I moved to Texas 20 two years ago, to be a space architect at NASA. And I started having kids and I wanted to go camping. And Texas has tarantulas and a lot more poisonous snakes than I ever had dealt with in New England. Plus the odd scorpion, plus at least around Houston, it's kind of swampy and sort of embarrassing, but not embarrassing at all that uh, in the summer, if you want an air conditioner, Um, even though, even if you're going for an outdoor experience. So that's that's where Taxa came from. I looked around at RVs and thought, I don't want a house on wheels. I want to take my family on an adventure. Um, and that started the slippery slope of designing adventure trailers, adventure equipment that you sleep in. Yeah. I was in a trailer this summer. I know exactly what you mean. You walk in and you feel like you walked into like a bad hotel room from the 90s with the linoleum and the like they, they have all of the the touches of home which is really not the vibe you're often going for when you're in the outdoors yeah i mean obviously a lot of people like it or there wouldn't be so many of them but uh i kind of kind of i really find it anathema to think of you know making a living room to take to a national park um you want to go outside and if the bugs or the weather or a sleeping child or whatever drive you inside, then it should be nice. Um, but the whole point is to, to have an outdoor adventure. So, you know, that's that's where we, uh, we meaning I, founded the company to be a, a Venn diagram overlap of what you need and what you want and how to have an adventure within that. And if you can do it for Mars, you can do it for Yosemite, I guess, is is the thinking here. Tell me about what it was like to work at NASA. How did you how, how did you get recruited into NASA? Um, I think it was all luck in some ways. But I was designing 22 years ago in New York a line of furniture that was super efficient. Um, 
and I took orders at my first furniture fair, and then and then I rejected 100% of my first production run. Um, right at the same time that following up visiting a friend who worked at NASA in Houston, um, NASA created an office called the Habitability Design Center that was all about the early parts of the space station, um, where NASA knew all about two-week sh shuttle missions, and the stuff they knew about six-month missions, which is the typical space station mission, um, was that astronauts lost about half of their science time, half of their productive time to, and that's the big question mark, to dot, 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 uh, you know, stress or boredom or, uh, I don't know, whatever it was. Uh, and so they hired some architects to try to think differently and to represent not just the fact that an astronaut could breathe and eat and go to the bathroom and do science, but uh, how well they could do that. So not just the physical possibility of breathing, but hey, you know, this is a nicer space. This, this removes irritation. It wasn't about designing beauty, at least not yet, particularly. Um, it was about thinking about being a person, not just an, an organism in some ways. While still working in very strict confines of, of physical limitations in space. Yeah, strict everything, strict sealed environments. I mean, in a weird way, you know, strict meaning power usage to cook a meal, you have to turn off a science experiment kind of thing, but also strict in weird ways that people don't think about a lot. Like they knew how much hair fell off the average astronaut's head or how many skin cells fell off because it ends up on an air filter and ends up being a, a, a trash problem. Um, so uh, strict in every way, meaning living in a sealed environment makes you uh, look at the world in a different way. Uh, in space, you have to solve that problem, but it made me look at our world in a different way because, uh, you know, what do you design and what do you use when you can't make all the casual assumptions that it's just going to be easy? Have any of your designs made it to space? A few things that I've touched are in space. Yes. Um, Very cool. not as many as I want, of course. Uh, and, but but yeah, uh, the chance to work on the space station and think about astronauts from different cultures and personal space and who needs privacy and who doesn't and, you know, just how, what astronauts bring with them for a little touch of personal um, that doesn't make them homesick but reminds them of home. You know, all sorts of funny, ironic design problems come up if you're thinking about outer space. So Taxa Outdoors is a design first company. And I wanted to just go back to the concept of habitat was something we talked a little bit about on the pre-interview. And I feel like, you know, everyone's seen The Martian. And I feel like everyone's favorite part of The Martian is is that concept of habitat where he's trying to create how he farms, how he lives. Like, I think people really got into those montages. How how do you think about habitat with Taxa? And, and how obviously, how was it informed by NASA? Yeah, I, I'll answer a little bit obliquely. Um, you know, we talked a few minutes ago about how the general RV paradigm is to make a house on wheels or a hotel room on wheels. Um, and we don't, though legally, three of our four products are RVs in all the states. Um, it's not a very useful word for us because, again, the people think a house on wheels and our customers think, yuck, I don't want that. Um, so Habitat sort of frees up your mind to think, you know, this is, you know, it, the equipment thing, the, the useful thing first, um, you know, the types of customers we have are dreaming about having an adventure and then they're looking for the equipment that supports that. And Habitat just lets people read into that more easily than RV, which has all sorts of associations with it. Um, it, you know, that tend not to be about the wilderness and tend not to be, about wilderness experiences or driving 20 miles down a dirt road and camping off off grid. Um, so habitats and, you know, we're pondering using adventure vehicle more and more because, you know, what Taxa was founded to answer people's dreams and ideals, not really, not really as a, a product. So habitat, I think, frees up your mind to think about that. And then in a building my business way, there are the habitats we've started with, but there are habitats without wheels. You know, what is a remote hotel room or what, what's in your backyard that, uh, I don't know, is, is a studio or a guest room or a place a nurse might live when, when you have aging parents or, uh, you know, habitats, 
you know, just aren't aren't a house. They're not a house on wheels, uh, but they're everything else that that involve people and utility. And you know, I am a aesthetic designer too, and some aspect of beauty. And uh, well, I don't know, con- contributing Fun- to just, the world. Function, yeah. Fun- efficient pure, pure function. function, efficient function. I'm just looking at your product line. You've got. And it's such, you're definitely the most, this is definitely the most involved product I've ever had on the D2C, D2C podcast. How did you, how did you build this company? Like how much, how did you, who were the first hires that you made in building this company? Um, so they were all architects in a factual way because I had my architecture studio and then started investing all our extra money or time uh, into Developing first the Cricket, which is really developed for me with my two small kids and my four-cylinder Subaru at the time. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. At first, I thought I would remain a design studio and pitch uh, an RV company and say, you are missing this whole outdoorsy REI customer crowd. Um, and that they would say, maybe, that I was a genius, or at least they'd hire me and uh, help help us do this. But they all said... You know, you know that we know about those people, um, but that's not who our market is, and we're busy enough right now, um, and we're not really the REI demographic yet, but we will be. And so, uh, none of them hired me. And then I, I met my my physician's brother, heard about what I was doing, and said, "Here's fifty thousand uh, dollars. Why don't you build a couple and see what happens?" And I did that, and I went to Outdoor Retailer, which at the time was where all the uh, outdoor industry in the sort of non-motorized categories um, introduces products, clothing and sunglasses and hiking boots and backpacks and sleeping bags. Uh, And I went to that show because that was my demographic. And I was saying, will these people accept a base camp idea? Um, Will... Will they see an RV or will they see what I was hoping to create, which was, again, this uh, the habitats, the adventure equipment you sleep in that that give you the ability to, and again, I, I keep speaking with ellipses in my sentences, you know, to keep going out there with your partner, but now you have a baby so you can change a diaper and not worry about the poisonous snake and your toddler or your dog, um, to just being you know, at base camp at the end of the day, being warm and cozy after a long day of exertion out there. Uh, so in a slippery so slope way, up I, with this thing, you rocked up to the conference with the one that you'd made the prototype. And uh, was that prototype the, number three? Yes. Prototype number three. And what was the response? Uh, it was great. I got lots of PR and press and I got sort of business confirmation and I started writing more involved business plans. Um, and at that time, relative to the D to C efforts, it was always, uh, you know, my first business plan. This is an anti RV company because that's that's how I felt. Um, I discovered shortly thereafter that that was not a true statement in a regulatory sense. Um, but the real challenge opportunity of our company is that, um, you know, we're not an RV. You know, we've with when I've had no money, we had to marry the RV distribution network, you know, and RV dealerships, because they, when you have a big product, you have to solve the sales and the distribution and then the, uh, the warranty service aspects of the, of the process. Um, and that's a, a regulatory thing. We have to tell the, every state we sell our product in that we're going to take care of our customers. But we've always wanted to be smarter than the RV industry or at least re- reinvent it. Um, and so we always knew that we had to go to meet our customer where they were, um, which means as direct as possible, um, while still acknowledging and solving the sort of 50-state problem of distribution and sales and and the legal stuff. Um, so like many others, we talk about Omnichannel a lot, and we, we talk and we've designed the company to really be as actively as we can be uh, first in line at the the top of the sales funnel to talk to our customers about whether our product is right for them, to make them aware that they are not limited to just a house on wheels option when they're thinking about comfortable camping and base camping. Um, And then, you know, work with our dealers and think of other other distribution modes and methods um, 
that let us, again, omni-channel is, I'm not sure it's the best word, but uh, we want to meet our customer where they need to be um, in every way, you know, in information way through social media and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. Um, on the phone, we love to talk to customers and potential customers um, at different types of shows that are not RV shows, but where our customers are at, you know, at mountain bike rallies or surfing contests or uh, overlanding rallies. You know, how do we, how do we get out there? Cause that's, it's so obviously the future and so obviously has been the future. Um, and the auto industry has been changing quite rapidly. The electric auto industry is doing exactly what we're talking about as fast as they can. How did Tesla – this may be an old question. And I feel like I may have read an article about it a while ago. But do you know how Tesla circumvented the dealership model and is the answer just cash? Uh, do you mean bribery or do you mean cash? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, no. Yeah, they've had whatever they've had. I'll round it up to a billion dollars to experiment and to uh, yeah. try to change the laws in different states. And in different states, they have changed the laws. Um and that means, you know, how can they sell direct but have showrooms or repair shops in different states um, but still sell direct? And I don't know if you remember th their first era when they would have showrooms in shopping malls. Um, and But the people in the showrooms weren't salespeople because that would be illegal and violate the states. They were only sort of... Uh, I don't know what to call them, marketing representatives that would yeah. get you on the phone or online to put your deposit down. Interesting. And Tesla has rattled through a number of, you know, they keep innovating or experimenting. And, you know, all the other companies that are following on their footsteps are doing the same thing. Um, so they are kind of inspiration, but they, I don't know, in a way that I'm totally jealous of. They're a much bigger company to, to run after this uh, sort of, more aggressively quickly than, than we've been able to. Um, but also, you know, we aren't against RV dealerships or dealerships. We just know they're going to be totally different in three or five years. And, you know, we can point again at auto dealerships where I've, when I buy a car these days, which isn't that often, it's like, I'm not going to dealerships to shop. I'm doing my shopping online. And then if I need to test drive, I make an appointment and I, indicate, hey, if you talk to me more than my test drive, I'm going to leave. <laughs> I'm going to leave, you know, make this discreet and easy for me. And when I decide to buy, I'm going to send out an email to the closest dealers and pick up the car at wherever they give me the best price and say that I'll be there the shortest time. Um, at, I've had a few people explain to me the pricing model is just totally like there's no, because of online, there's just no, there's not a lot of hagger, you know, haggling basically in, in the modern dealership environment. Yeah, no, that's true. But there is that RV dealers and our, our customers, we now, we now have the data that says, you know, I forget, you know, 72% of our customers say we, we would prefer not to go buy this at an RV dealership. Um, and, you know, that lets us talk to our RV dealerships, many of whom are great. You know, they, they want to change too. And they are trying to listen to us and their end customer about how do we make this work? Uh, but yeah, the haggling thing is big. I'm not a one, I'm not very good at it, but a two, I hate it. I hate haggling. Um, and that's, you know, our, our customers, that's not where our customers are. They are more like a Tesla customer or a Rivian customer who wants to be talked to and interacted with in all these different ways at interstitial moments. Um, and then, then have their adventure ready for them, served up to them. Uh, you know, that's how I am, even though I'm over 50, but that's certainly how a 40-year-old and a 30-year-old and a 20-year-old are and all their different sort of micro-generation expectations of. And I, I, you know, I haven't listened to all your episodes, but D to C, you know, at its purest is like there's just two, two entities interacting, the customer and the company. Um but really, if you think about, it, there's always a distribution problem and a packing problem and a delivery problem. Um, and when you make a really big product, that that amplifies. I think there's you can't you, you can't assume an Amazon and a UPS, um, and therefore you have to think about how you blend in-person experiences with online experiences. And 
you know, there's uh, tipping points. It's not the best phrase, but, you know, as a company grows, especially with a big company, there's like, oh, has tax have been around long enough? And have I ever seen one out in the wild to believe that it's real and it's good? Um, and once, once you've achieved that and we have, you know, then people, because of EVs, et cetera, are pretty happy to put down a deposit online and make a reservation and uh, expect their, you know, their really quite expensive product. They're willing to do that online as long as they have been able to physically, actually, or mentally kick the tires. You have to kick any product that you actually have to go inside of it. You can't really circumvent that, that, you know, that experiential part of it, right? Whether it's a That's car right. or, or a habitat. Um, super, super interesting. So what would you say has been the most successful lever? You know, you mentioned events, you mentioned some content. What's been the most successful lever for growing awareness of the product? Or has it been just this really steady steam gathering ship? I always feel awkward as the founder because I'm, I'm full of traumatic stories of the past 12 years of napkin sketch to now. Um, it's really uh, digital. Is the is both the most economical but also the most efficient. You know, our our number one preferred but always evolving opinion uh, method is Instagram. Um, and but it's you know it our user groups are all on Facebook, uh, where our user groups are both opinionated owners but also newbies who want to see if they want a product. Um, you know, they are brainstorming about how to go on trips and what's a great campsite and what's the best Tupperware to pack your pasta in to fit in our shelving systems. Um, and wait, what was my sentence there? You know, those Facebook groups, you know, spin off into the ones who are photographers recommend their Instagram channels. Uh, we develop lots of organic contact content from our users because uh, they tend to be, Living their best lives, savvy. living and, and when sharing it. The, use, yeah. yeah, exactly. When they're using your product, they're living their best lives. I'm seeing some custom, sweet custom ones on here too. Is that athletic brewing? It is athletic brewing. Yeah, no, we are getting much more sophisticated and easy for us uh, to make special editions, you know, whether it's for marketing or whether it's for a specific customer. Our woolly bears, we can tweak the colors fairly instantly now. Um, yes, so... You know, our products are our billboards. That's, I guess that's an advantage of a large product, uh, but it's taken a long time. When I first started out 10 years ago, I would have one product on the road and it would be in Montana and we'd get a call from Florida. And they'd say, when can I see it? And it would be like, I, don't, I have no idea. <laughs> can you go to Montana? Um, but now we have product in every state. And in a what I would call part of the omni-channel D2C continuum, you know, we have customers who are happy to be ambassadors and show people products uh, so that they can kick the tires in someone's driveway or they can uh, talk to someone, again, whether it's through Facebook or whether our habitat specialists who are who are our in-house phone takers um, will set you up with a dealer, a person, or an expert. Um I really like this athletic brewing partnership idea. Have you done that more than like, so it looks like it was a contest with athletic brewing and then yeah, you get exposed ended up to their up that audience. Cricket. Yeah. That's amazing. That's such, that's like that. Is that a repeatable model? Do you think to reach a broader audience to partner with other D 2 C brands who are uh, collaborative in the space? Yeah, I would say it's, it's all but a movement to do collaborations with, uh, complementary products. Um, you know, across, I'm, I'm deep in the outdoor industry. So certainly in the outdoor industry, uh, we've worked with Topo Designs, who you may or may not know in a outdoor clothing way. Um, and that's, you know, it's all great. We, we very much share a social and outdoor mission with the companies we work with. Um, you know, we, we just think people should go outside and have a great experience and that that's a compliment to their, their home life and their work life. Um, and we're not, we're not hard up on being like only hardcore equipment. We are also that, but you know, whether you are want to go a hundred miles down a dirt road or two miles, we're kind of agnostic. Our product will take you there. Um, 
so that's kind of fun. You can dial up the uh, sort of what's it like the expert equipment versus the gentle outdoor messages. You know, I, I love the relative, I love the relative to the types of collaborations you're doing. Yeah, very cool. I love the. I, I've been talking to a lot of brands recently that use their groups and their communities as a way to sort of uh, think tank their next products and product innovations and things like that. But I'm wondering from someone like you, who's such a, you have probably a very exacting vision uh, and also an exacting requirement, you know, of, of the physics of everything. Are you, do you guys, do you take a lot of uh, input on the designs and the amenities and the, the new products you develop uh, from your, your audience? Uh, yes. I can't say no to that question. Um, I know. The, uh, <laughs> no. No, it's it's really funny to me, but and I'm totally a founder. You know, I founded it for me. The first product was literally for me, and it it rung it rung a bell in a lot of people's hearts and souls about what they what what had been missing, the product that had been, been missing in their lives. Um, but no, we're much bigger than that, and we listen, and we I have certain lines I won't cross. I don't think you'll ever find a microwave in any of my products, um, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, we we use our groups and we interact with our groups, and uh, you know, we ask them questions about whatever, whatever it is. What's your definition of what a good shower twenty miles down a dirt road is? Um, what is your comfort level if you and your partner, you know, one of you grew up being a totally outdoors and the other one didn't? How do you how do we think about a product uh, and removing barriers to entry so that? You guys can go have adventures together when one of you is scared or inexperienced or both of you are thinking, I used to be a total wilderness person, but again, I ha we have a child now. Like, is that different or is that not different? And, you know, it's great. The, the spectrum of people who want to go outside is giant. It's always been giant. And with the pandemic uh, and people really rethinking their relationship to, you know, to the room they're sitting in all day to the, what's outside, to the adventures they can have locally. You know, that's, you know, that's, I, I think a lot of outdoor companies would, would say that's really, you know, a negative event has a really inspiring outcome potentially relative to how people think about spending time outdoors. Um, and that's really exciting, you know, as we develop long roadmaps, you know, Taxa started with big habitats and we have habitats on the drawing boards for sure that you haven't seen yet. But we think about other products and other efforts to remove barriers to getting outside. Um, so we do more nonprofit work like with big brothers, big sisters and take kids who don't get a chance to go play in the woods, uh, out in the woods uh, and rock their world and get their, their bigs or their parents out there with them. And again, you know, that's the most satisfying thing ever to see as a, people. As a dad, like, I'll just up. interrupt. Just as a dad, I'm, yeah. I like it's literally I, I take my daughter camping. I took her, took her five, six times past two years in the summer. And it's literally like the only time that she gets to like run around on independent, totally independent. She was eight at the time. You know, she's on her bike. She's with walkie talkies. She's just like there's a real there's something inherently good about getting out in even just in these little campsites just to get out in nature just especially for the kids so i i really really appreciate that that's cool no it's it's crazy important and i can refer you to books about how your brain chemistry changes when you get outside and uh yeah. the fractals how, of know, nature right I, I think stress we're, levels you live go in down square, and you live in these in these square habitats that your mind isn't really tuned for right when you get outside you get that if you're if you're on a bike or something, you get that parallax effect. You get all the fractals of nature. It's great, and I think as a DTC, I, I like it makes me think there's a play for us to do a, a big giveaway uh, for for DTC listeners because I think there is that that sort of like with a bunch of DTC marketers, and I think there's a, a lot of the contingent that does really like to get outdoors. Uh, so so I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, there's thousands of events that we've collaborated with people over the years. You know, outdoor festivals, and you know, what is a, a portable uh, festival marketplace booth, and uh, how do you send your crew out to places to, you know, with, for instance, the Access Fund or Leave No Trace, who we sponsored in the past, to send their field crews out and their field educators to go teach classes somewhere. Um, yeah, but I yes, no, back to the kids, the kids outside thing, and watching. 
I mean, you're not only watching them drop the layers of school and, you know, connection, but you're doing it too. Uh, and that's the best. And it, it's fun to fight with people about, not fight, I shouldn't have used that word, to talk with people in a product development way about who needs to be connected all the time and who's doing this to disconnect. And, you know, I'm certainly doing it to disconnect, but that doesn't mean I turn my phone off. But that's sometimes I think that's a weakness that I haven't turned my phone off. And sometimes I think it's good to be able to get the call because whatever. You're a startup my teenage, founder. Right. You're, given, you, you're given a little <laughs> leeway as a, as a startup founder, I think, when, that, when it comes to that. It's still, you still get the benefit when you're outdoors. Uh, I wanted to ask you, who's your dream influencer? Who, who, if you could pick one person out there who would just become the champion of taxa, uh, I didn't ask you that in the pre-interview, but I'm curious in your mind, who would that be? Yeah, that's not a fair question if you didn't yeah. ask me. Um, uh, God, I don't know. You know, it's not really a celebrity. Yeah. I, you know, it, it's any family who uh, who goes out there and, and shares that adventure, I think. You know, that's, yeah. I feel like a Hallmark card or something. But it <laughs> one of the coolest things I've gotten to be able to do is when we've had rallies and there are 30 crickets and mantises around to just see um, all the the like the diversity of people who have one who've come together to share it, but it's like here is this woman who's all but retired and remote working, and here is a family with three kids under five in a mantis where it's the coolest uh, you know jungle gym treehouse <laughs> thing in the world, and you know all sixty of us are gathered around a campfire and telling stories, for, you know whether it's business history stories or about the ultra marathon they just watched or the butterfly they, they found, you know, it's, I don't, you know, it's like, how do you make, I'm, I'm not being very articulate, like the conversations sitting around a campfire are so elemental and so contrary or complementary to the, the stuff you have to do at work. It's, it's just a revelation. It's a revelation for me every time I go out. It's like, why why didn't I do this last weekend too? Is how yeah. I, I think. I need to go and camping. You, I haven't gone camping in too long now. The modern person needs it. And I think anyone listening, uh, camping is, is the best expression of it uh, to get out there. Overlanding I haven't done yet would be the best. I think I might do some hiking this summer with a friend of mine. We might do a bit of the West Coast Trail, which I'm really for. But just make sure you get out there. Turn this podcast out. Get out. Get outside. Get some, some, you know, get the fractals of nature on you. Um, I, 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 but one, before that, I have my, my last question, which is how, like, just in terms of how you think about your growth in 2023, if we were to give you $50,000 to be spent in the next couple months, how would you spend that in your marketing to uh, see the biggest growth? Uh, well, we would throw it at social media, trying to, again, well, not again, the, our products, Camping is seasonal for a lot of the company, and it's like the the winter months are the dreaming months, and the spring months are the planning, especially if you're thinking about a big piece of equipment, and spring and very early summer are the buying months. So we have a big seasonality to the exposure of our product, and and actually the types of content we put on social media or YouTube, et cetera, are, are kind of thoughtful about how we, we plant a seed and then we uh, we work to convert people. Um, you know the the I forget the marketing term. The length of the, the decision cycle is very different depending on when you've heard of our product. Um, you know, in June you kind of hear about it and want to buy it. In December you're like, oh, cool. Do it? Can I? Do I have time to join a forum and ask questions and plan my family trip to Alaska and this and that? Um, so I always think of the stories we can tell on, on Instagram and how to make them more diverse. It's not just national park. It's also, I don't know, in a parking lot at a little league game, a little league tournament where you're there for four hours. Um, so I always think of, of increasing the diversity of the, the stories we depict. Um, do you ever boost? What do you do on the ad side? I think we didn't really get into that very much, but this, this sounds like organic content. What do you do to amplify your message with ads? Oh, I'm not the expert anymore at my company, but uh, yeah. we do all those things. Uh, yeah. You know, organic is the best because it's kind of free. But the um, how do we seed for organic? So we are running ads all over the place um, and uh, paying for 
uh, you know, advertising reels on Instagram, et cetera, um, to get there and to, to be able to target our, you know, our lead heaviest states or, or business areas, you know, to use micro targeting, macro targeting. It's not just like everyone else. We can be pretty specific about where our markets are. And where the, yeah, where the distribution is to back it up. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. How does the quiz play? This may be not something you're, you're, that's fully on your radar as well, but I always notice when brands build quizzes into their, into their buying cycle. Is that something that gets used a lot? Uh, yeah, we have good, good engagement with that. I mean, one, it, it lets us know things about you, but it lets you know, hey, I am two people or I am four people, and this is my idea of adventure. Which, which one of your habitats is going to work for me? Um, you know, it's great when you do the quiz and then you you have a conversations with one of our habitat specialists who are there. You know, yeah, we want to sell you something, but really, they're really habitat specialists. They go camping, they ride mountain bikes, or they play tennis, or, you know, they want to answer your questions uh, so that you are making the right decision. Um, so we are we are gathering data and they are gathering data. That's that's the, uh, I don't know what that's called, the sharing economy. It's not a one-way street um, because going outside is, especially if you haven't done it a lot, is, is there's an education to it and a comfort level and a support. Um, Are the products available in Canada as one of my final questions? Because I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm in your funnel now. Uh, yes, so they curious, are. Can I actually get these in Canada? Okay, good to know. Um, I believe historically we are... Our, we've had our dealer in uh, British Columbia longer than our dealer in Montreal, Quebec area. And I, I think we're imagine. just opening one in the Toronto area. Very cool. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I, I have an object of my affection. I'm going to look at a cricket for my daughter and I and some of our upcoming camping trips. I don't know if I'll be able to pull it off this uh, this quick. And I don't know if my car can pull it. Can I, can I, I, I like that you had a Subaru Outback. That's what I had, uh, a four-cylinder Subaru Outback. Um, but it has all wheel drive, which is big. Now I'm in a RAV4 with only front wheel drive. I worry if that could pull a cricket. I do not have that memorized. I know, okay. and it depends on the year also, but I know, yes. uh, many of the modern RAV4s can tow a cricket. Amazing. Well, but I, I don't know. You... Yeah. Generally, <laughs> tow... <laughs> generally tow capacity is about stopping power, not about pulling power. Okay. Good to um, know. This is not a legally binding conversation, so there's there's no issue if, uh, if I get it. But uh, I, I want to thank you for coming on the D2C podcast. If people want to know more about Taxa, they should go to taxaoutdoors.com. Take a look. Uh, I'm sure you'll get retargeted by by some ads after the fact, and you can start thinking about whether whether it's right for you. But I, but I think it's, uh, it's such a cool product. Super happy to have you on, on the podcast today. Thanks, Garrett. Eric, it's been a real pleasure to talk about ideas and philosophy on product and how we talk to people, which is what we all want to do. Amazing. All right. Well, we'll see you out. We'll see you outside. Have you ever been to Vancouver Island? It is a very high vibe outdoorsy place. Have you been here? I have. Yes. What's the town? Nice. You, you, you clue it. Oh, you clue. It's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Wolves on the beach. Um, very cool. Yes. I love it there. Uh, I look at, I fantasize about property up there all the time. <laughs> nice. Well, we, we'll we'll make it happen. I'll get a Garrett. I'll, I'll get a taxa. You get some property up here, and we'll meet on the beach with the wolves. Thanks, Garrett. This is fun. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at direct to consumer all one word dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C podcast. We'll see you next time.